What are the most common symptoms of COVID? Fever, cough, shortness of breath. It's also common to have body aches. But COVID-19 is sometimes more than just a respiratory disease, or sometimes not a respiratory disease at all. It can mimic just about any illness. Sometimes it looks like a common cold. Sometimes it looks like influenza. Sometimes it looks like a stomach bug with belly pain, diarrhea, maybe some nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite. It can cause pink eye, a runny nose, loss of taste and smell. Sometimes even whole body rashes or areas of swelling and redness of the skin in just a few spots. It's also kidney damage, heart damage. This is a section of a heart of a patient who had severe COVID disease. This patient had inflamed lungs with ARDS and tiny clots in his lungs. And that made it hard for his right ventricle to pump blood to his lungs. And that's what causes his right ventricle to weaken and become dilated. So like I mentioned, severe disease is causing blood clots to form in a lot of patients. When blood clots are found in the lungs, they're called pulmonary emboli. Some COVID patients have presented with a stroke as a result of having blood clots in their brain. COVID has also presented in other ways, sometimes with seizures, also Guillain-Barre syndrome. This makes it incredibly difficult to diagnose and even harder to treat. This disease can present in so many ways. There's never been a disease in the history of mankind that's presented in so many different ways. When it comes to how this virus invades our body and causes disease, there are some things we know, some things we think we know, and then some things we just don't know. How about we start with what we know? When the virus lands in our eyes, nose, or mouth, or sometimes when we inhale into our lungs, the spike proteins of the virus bind to the ACE2 receptor on the surface of certain cells, and that's how it gains entry. These ACE2 receptors are found in many different parts of the body. Once the virus gains entry, not only does it make millions of copies of itself, but it also alters the cell's ability to call for help. It's like the cells that get infected, they can't call the police, at least not initially. Once the virus is deeply embedded in our body, it begins to cause more severe disease. This is where direct attack on other organs that have ACE2 receptors can occur, including heart muscle, kidneys, blood vessels, liver, and the brain. Early findings, including those from multiple autopsy and biopsy reports, show that viral particles can be found not only in the nasal passages and throat, but also in tears, stool, kidneys, liver, pancreas, and the heart. One case report found evidence of viral particles in the CSF, meaning the cerebral spinal fluid. That's the fluid around the brain. The patient ended up having meningitis. Oh, I forgot to mention that one earlier. So this virus can also cause meningitis, which is inflammation of the membranes that encapsulate the brain and spinal cord. And here is an electron microscopic picture of the virus in kidney cells. And to give you perspective, one nanometer is one ten millionth the size of a centimeter. The red arrows point to the virus, and the green arrows point to the spikes of the virus. And the virus altogether is about 65 nanometers in diameter. So the virus is sometimes going to all these different organs by means of attaching to the ACE2 receptors that are there. But that's not even the whole story. Because in some cases, by the time the body's immune system figures out that the body's being invaded, it's like unleashing the military to stomp out the virus. And in that process, there's a ton of collateral damage. This is what we refer to as the cytokine storm. Rantes is a chemokine that is thought to play a large role in the COVID-19 cytokine storm, which binds to the CCR5 receptors on CD4 and CD8T lymphocytes. Essentially, propagating further inflammation, and possibly propagating further clotting. When the virus gets into the alveolar cells, meaning the tiny little air sacs within the lungs, it makes a ton of copies of itself, and then it goes on to invade more cells. The alveoli's next door neighbor is guess who? Yeah, the thinnest blood vessels in your body, the capillaries. So the lining of those capillaries is called endothelium, which also have ACE2 receptors. And once the virus invades those capillaries, Boy, oh boy, that's when the immune system gets triggered AF, as in PAF. PAF stands for platelet activating factor, also known as acetylglycerol ether phosphorylcholine, whatever. But this PAF is a big deal because it's a potent phospholipid activator. So what does that mean? It means that it serves as the trigger for the onslaught of inflammation and, and clotting. And early autopsy results are also showing widely scattered clots in multiple organs, 
In one study from the Netherlands, one third of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 got clots despite already being on a prophylactic dose of blood thinner. And the real number is likely higher than that because I promise you most doctors are not looking for clots in COVID patients until recently. So not only are you getting the inflammation with the cytokine storm, but you're also forming blood clots that can travel to other parts of the body and cause major blockages, effectively damaging those organs. So wait a minute, doc, you're telling me that this can cause organ damage by one, directly attacking organs by their ACE2 receptors? Yeah. Two, indirectly attacking organs by way of collateral damage through the cytokine storm? Yeah. Three, indirectly cause damage to organs by means of blood clots? Yep. Four, indirectly cause organ damage by low oxygen levels or improper ventilator settings or side effects from the medications that we give? Yeah. And back to the whole blood clot thing. If you saw my video on blood clots in COVID patients, you'll know that antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or APS, that just might be the link to explain why so many COVID patients are getting blood clots, like what this autopsy showed in the lungs with blood clots here. Not only did it have blood clots, but these lungs are inflamed and showed findings consistent with ARDS when it was looked at underneath the microscope. These lungs were heavy, filled with fluid, and much stiffer than normal lungs. All these factors make it hard for the lungs to move air in and out. It makes it hard to get oxygen from that air into the blood. And this was another autopsy here where they sliced up small pieces of lung and looked at it underneath the microscope. These are tiny little blood clots within the lung capillaries. And the lining of these lung capillaries is called the endothelium. And this endothelium is destroyed by the virus and by inflammation. This is a picture of the endothelial cells undergoing apoptosis. So apoptosis is a process where the cell programs itself to die, which is what sometimes happens when a cell gets infected. And endothelial cells are more vulnerable to dying in people with pre-existing endothelial dysfunction, which is more often associated with being a male, being a smoker, having high blood pressure, having diabetes, having obesity, and if all these sound familiar, maybe that's because these are all the associated risk factors for worse outcomes in COVID-19. But let's get back to blood clots, because these blood clots can form and or travel to other parts of the body. When blood clots travel to the toes and cause blockages in blood flow there, meaning ischemia or infarction, that can cause gangrene there. And lots of times patients with gangrene require amputation. So here's a picture of what we call COVID toes. And it doesn't just affect toes, it also affects other areas of skin. This is a picture of something we call purpura, which results of capillaries bursting open, which is a result of the clots that are forming there. So is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or APS, is that the cause of all these blood clots in patients with severe COVID? Maybe. It's a tricky diagnosis. Some patients with APS have what's called catastrophic APS, or CAPS, C-A-P-S. With CAPS, these patients can have strokes, seizures, heart attacks, kidney failure, ARDS, skin changes like the ones I mentioned earlier in this video. So this begs the question, is this what's going on in patients with severe COVID-19? It sure does look like it. Viral infectious diseases, particularly those of the respiratory tract, have been reported as being the triggers for CAPS. The pathogenesis is complex, and it might involve the activation of toll-like receptor 4, TLR4, which triggers a cytokine storm, followed by alterations to the endothelium of lung capillaries, which serves as the trigger for inducing the cytokine storm. When you take a step back and think about it, there aren't a lot of diseases that cause clots to form in the arteries. Usually, it's when we have plaques in our arteries and then those plaques rupture and they travel downstream and cause a blockage. This is what happens when we have a heart attack. When someone has atrial fibrillation, the atria are fibrillating so quickly, meaning they're quivering. When this happens, the pool of blood sitting there becomes stagnant, and that's why people with atrial fibrillation are at higher risk of developing clots there. That clot can then travel to other organs and cause a blockage of blood flow there. When it goes to the brain, it can cause a stroke. When it goes to the leg, it can cause gangrene. When it goes to the arteries of the gut, it can cause mesenteric ischemia or infarction, where the gut tissue can then die off. There's various factors that increase the risk of developing arterial thrombosis, meaning arterial clots. Classically, the cardiovascular dependent risk factors implicated in clotting have been 
high blood pressure, meaning hypertension, high levels of cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, age, chemotherapy, and the degree of infection. So all of these contribute toward developing arterial thrombosis. Hmm. You know what? These same risk factors also sound a lot like the same risk factors for people who have severe COVID disease. Yeah, so it seems like there's some correlation there. And you know something else? There's really only one other medical condition that is well known to cause clots in both the veins and arteries, and that's APS. The other medical conditions that are known to cause clots, such as factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation, heparin-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or HIT for short, also other conditions like PNH, which is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, these conditions don't really cause clots to form in arteries. The blood clots that form in these conditions almost always form clots in veins. But with APS, they often form clots in both, or at least are more likely to form clots in arteries. When you combine that knowledge with what we saw just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, with these patients having COVID-19 and developing blood clots in their arteries, and all of them being positive for antiphospholipid antibodies, it really makes you wonder if this is the reason that's causing some COVID patients to die. So we'll need more studies looking into these, and I'm going to make a video where I deep dive into APS and CAPS, and I'm going to discuss how we make that diagnosis because it is a tricky diagnosis, but also I'll talk about how we treat it. Part of the reason why it can be tricky is because it can be confused with something called DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation, but they're not the same thing. See, a lot of patients with severe COVID-19 have certain labs that resemble DIC, such as increased PT-INR, increased PTT, decreased levels of platelets. But the reason why these COVID patients who develop clots in the study I mentioned earlier, the reason why they don't have DIC is actually two reasons. One, they weren't having extensive bleeding. And two, they didn't have low fibrinogen levels. And if it's truly DIC, you'd have both of these things. Anyway, you can probably glean from this video why it's so hard for doctors to figure out what is going on with the virus. Between the variable ways this disease can present in different patients and the different ways that organs can suffer damage, yeah, this is really, really, really complicated. And we still are just scratching the surface with just how much we know about it. There's so many pieces of the puzzle that we're still putting together, but at least it's starting to form a picture. Thanks for watching this video.